Thanks so much for that great introduction. And thanks to the organizers, organizers for putting this meeting together. It's really nice to be here. So we were asked in this session to think about uh, the future of research labs, labs, labs of, uh, of, of the future. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, doing this in a really concrete way and thinking about how we can use new technologies to better understand, predict, and prevent suicidal behavior, something that our research lab has been studying. So by way of context, let me just say that suicide is a complicated problem, which you can probably all agree on. This is something that's been around for thousands of years, and the human mind has been perplexed by why people would intentionally end their lives for a really, really long time. And unfortunately, this remains one of the leading causes of death. Suicide is the tenth leading cause of all death. And whereas other leading causes of death, the, the rate has dropped over the years. Over the past hundred years, for instance, the rate of death by heart disease, cancers, pneumonia, accidents have all fallen re really precipitously. The suicide rate today is almost identical to what it was a hundred years ago. So it's a problem that we really haven't had a lot of traction on. Some would note we have made some progress, and we certainly have. We've identified some, some, some risk factors. We have some promising interventions. But I would argue that progress has been slow, and in many areas, it's been really stagnant. Many might disagree with this, and I, I think you should never take a person's word for anything, really. Uh, but as W. Edwards Deming has said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. So I brought some data to try and provide some context on why it's important to, to change the way we're doing things. So our, our lab, led by Joe Franklin here, recently uh, completed a study where we looked at every study we can find over the past 50 years that tried to predict suicide attempts or suicide deaths. And one thing we wondered is, are we getting better? Using the methods we've been using over the past 50 years, are our predictive effects increasing? Do we see our odds ratios here moving from left to right increase over the years? Are we getting better and better at identifying more accurate risk factors? Are those bars going up? And unfortunately, they're not. They're about even. If anything, it looks like as we're doing more and more study, our, our, the magnitude of our effects is actually decreasing. Well, why might this be? If we look at what risk factors we've been examining over the past 50 years and what methods we've, we've been using, what we find is we're using the same methods, largely self-reports and interviews, and we're looking at the same categories of risk factors over and over and over again. In fact, across these five decades, we've looked at the same five categories of risk factors every decade. We looked at demographics, we looked at DSM symptoms, we looked at past self-injurious thoughts and behaviors, negative life events, and in fact, in about 75 to 80 percent of all the analyses that have been done over the past 50 years, we've looked at these five categories. So again, we've been doing the same thing. So it's not surprising if we're using the same predictors and we're using the same methods, we shouldn't be surprised that we keep getting the same results. What we need here is to really update our approach and try and do things differently, and I think this is why many of us are here today. So what I want to talk about is how we might use advances in technology to try and improve the situation, to try and advance our understanding and ability to predict and prevent. You've heard today about a lot of really cool cutting edge methods. What I want to argue for in the brief few minutes that I have is to not just grab a piece of, of technology or an advance because it looks cool or it sounds interesting or it had a nice result in one area. What we should really focus on as psychologists and psychiatrists and mental health specialists is identifying gaps and trying to find a method that addresses those gaps or addresses the questions that we have and use uh, advances to, to make uh, progress in that way. There's lots of gaps in lots of different areas. I'm going to focus on suicide and I'll focus, given the short time I have, on, on my favorite three. Many of what I discuss though is going to be relevant, I think, to lots of other areas that you may be interested in, drug abuse, alcohol use, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, and so on. So one huge gap we have in this area is we don't have objective indicators of risk. We largely rely on what a person tells us. And, we, and there was a discussion earlier about how useful is self-report. I'm not saying self-report isn't important, but as I'll describe, it's limited in many ways. So we need objective indicators of risk that we really don't have in psychiatry. And so I'll argue for, and, and try and build on what Laura discussed, bringing tools from the lab out to the web, out to the clinic, out to people's devices. I'll also talk about the need for real-time data. It's really striking. This is something that in psychology we've, we've heard about for decades. Tim Bergen, more recently Jerry Kagan from Harvard, has talked about the fact that the way we do psychological research in laboratories is really kind of bizarre. In most areas of science, be it biology, chemistry, astronomy, we identify some really important constructs, some really important phenomenon, and we go out and observe it carefully in the world, and we probe its properties to really understand how it works. In psychology, we find some interesting construct or phenomenon, and we create some really bizarre artificial environment in our lab and try and understand it in that way, completely out of its normal context. And this is why, many would argue, we failed to make the kind of progress that we need. We, now, with, with new technologies, we can literally bring the lab to the person. And I'll talk a little bit about some ways in which we can do that. 
And finally, we really need more effective interventions. This is a large part of why the suicide rate hasn't changed over the past 100 years. There's lots of interventions that get done, but they have very, they have very little data for their efficacy or effectiveness. We have some new approaches that have been developed that have shown promise, and an increasing number of these are automated and so could be really easily scaled and disseminated and could have a real impact. So I'll, I'll spend about two minutes moving through each of these things. So first, in terms of objective markers of, of risk, the current state of the art is to ask people, if we want to know if they're suicidal or self-injurious, to ask them, are you thinking about suicide? Are you planning on hurting yourself and killing yourself? We should do this because about two-thirds of people who die by suicide told others about it ahead of time. But this approach is limited because people often have a, have a motivation to deny or conceal thoughts of suicide for fear of being intervened upon. While two-thirds of people tell others they were su they're thinking about suicide, 80% of people who die by suicide explicitly denied their thoughts and intent about suicide in their last communication before dying. So we need methods that don't just rely on a person's self-report. So practically speaking, we have a person in front of us saying, I don't want to hurt myself, I don't want to kill myself. What we really want to know is what might this person be thinking about suicide? What are their unspoken thoughts or their implicit cognitions? Things that don't rely on conscious introspection and explicit self-reporting. This is something we've always wanted to know about. Fortunately, in the past few decades, social and cognitive psychologists have developed ways of measuring people's thoughts, their mental states, in ways that don't rely on self-report using tests of memory or reaction time. One example of this is the Implicit Association Test, or IAT. Who's heard of the IAT? Wonderful. Most, of pe most people here. This is a brief, about three-minute reaction time test that asks you to classify stimuli as being, in this case, like death or like life, or like me or not like me, and based on the speed of your reaction time, we can make inferences about the extent to which you might be thinking about suicide. Laura mentioned Test My Brain. In a similar way, we've put some of these tests online in a website called Project Implicit Mental Health, which is at implicitmentalhealth.com, which if you're interested, you can go and take uh, IATs about suicide, self-injury, mood disorders, anxiety, substance use, eating, completely anonymously, like Test My Brain. This is a, a publicly available site that provides a, a public education function but also collects data. And what we found is significant differences between people who are not suicidal, people who have been suicidal in the past, and people who have been suicidal more recently. Significant differences across these groups. And Laura's mentioned the, the importance of, of sort of large-scale data collection. This, in this study, we collected data from 6,000 people, randomly split it in half, ran analyses in 3,000, and then another 3,000 and found the results do replicate across multiple samples. We can also take these tests and bring them to the clinic, and we've done this as well. So the, the sort of model is brick and mortar early on, develop the test, then bring it online, make sure results are, are uh, exist in a general population, make sure they replicate, and then bring it to clinical settings. So we've set up in local emergency rooms, inpatient units, and tested people passing through to try and see might these measures be useful in clinical settings. And we see that people who score high compared to low on the IAT have a three times the rate of suicide attempts when followed outside the hospital. These are people passing through the psychiatric emergency room. <laughs> we've also found that performance on tests like this can improve the prediction of who's going to make a suicide attempt post-hospital discharge above and beyond things like chart diagnosis, clinician prediction, clinicians unfortunately are no better than chance at predicting who's going to make a suicide attempt and who's not, beyond patient prediction, beyond things like uh, severity of suicide ideation and other clinical factors. And th this test and this effect also has been replicated across multiple samples. And a, a benefit of tests like this is it can be administered on mobile devices. So we're just finishing up a study at, in the Mass General emergency room with colleagues there where we collected data from 2,000 people using uh, this test and others on an, administered on an iPad. So objective tests that have been developed in a lab can pretty easily be brought out into the world and out into clinical settings. Switching now to talk about real-time data collection, again, this is something that we haven't really done in psychology because the technology hasn't really been there and hasn't really been in the area of suicide. And we haven't even done a lot of lab-based research on suicide in terms of what suicidal thoughts actually look like because ethically speaking, we can't bring people into a lab and try and uh, elicit thoughts of suicide for, for, for ethical reasons, which we can do with mood, things like mood and anxiety. What we can do now with newer technologies is go out into a, a person's life and measure their suicidal thinking. So we find people who say they have thoughts of suicide, and we load up smartphone apps onto their phone and ask them about suicidal thoughts four to six times a day over a period of a month or so. And what we're finding is, m although most of what we know about suicide has been collected by asking people, have you thought about suicide? Have you never thought about suicide? And trying to identify differences. What if we monitor the people who say yes? Do they all look the same? Of course not. We see tremendous variability in people's hour-by-hour -hour suicidal thinking. This is a measure of 
or a, a graphic depiction of dozens of people, each line's a different person, and on the y-axis, on the, on the heart, uh, vertical axis here, is severity of suicidal thinking. And you can see, we just highlighted a few people here in different colors, people's patterns are all over the place. Uh, so there's great variability from hour to hour in people's severity of suicidal thinking. Is there any pattern in, this, in, in, in these findings? I didn't see any when I looked at this, and we, we took each person's data and laid it out on the floor, and we couldn't detect anything with the naked eye. But when we do a latent profile analysis, we do see, so, so using people's data to see are there different kinds of profiles, we do see five different profiles emerge here, and they're color-coded color -coded here for ease of uh, inspection. It, each of these boxes is, are, are data from a different person, and on the horizontal axis is time, and on the vertical axis is severity of ideation. What you see is people in the green on top. These are people, so all these folks said, yes, I think about suicide. People in green have very low severity of ideation. They have a lot of zeros with a few little, a few little clicks up. People in yellow have low severity with bigger increases. People in purple have moderate severity with moderate variability. People in red have pretty high severity. They have no zeros. They're persistently thinking about suicide. And people in blue have high severity but high variability. People in red were the most likely to have recently made a suicide attempt. And we collected data from a second sample of people and the same five profiles emerged. So we think these might be, they're certainly replicable profiles, but maybe we'll see these more generally when we scale this up even further. And so what we're doing now is following these folks uh, using not only active monitoring, but passive monitoring using J.P. Onella's BWE app. But I won't say more about that. So he'll come up and as people have promised earlier, he'll tell you more about that. And we're also working with uh, Ross Picard at MIT and her, and her colleagues there, who I'm just gonna speak tomorrow, having people wear biosensors continuously and trying to see what kind of signals might be predictive of increases in suicidal ideation and the transition to suicide attempt. And so the idea is to use advanced technology to better understand how suicidal thoughts and behaviors change over time and to better identify profiles that can predict the transition from not thinking about suicide to thinking about it and then thinking about it to actually acting on suicidal thoughts. And once we can identify people at risk, what we then want to do is intervene. And historically, the way we've done intervention is also pretty primitive and pretty crude. If you think about it, if someone says, I want to kill myself, what we do is we hospitalize them if we think they're really high risk. Once they leave the hospital, we say, come and talk to us for 50 minutes once a week from now moving forward. Not perhaps the best way to go about things. Wouldn't it be great if when we identify people in real time, we can beam interventions to them in time and place where they can be treated where they, where they sit? And one example of this, and I'll, and I'll end with this, is, a, is an app that was recently created in our lab called Therapeutic Evaluative Conditioning. And this is work uh, led by Joe Franklin and, and, and colleagues. And what this is, is basically a brief classical conditioning app which tries to increase people's aversion to suicide or self-injury. It's a quick little matching game that you load up on your phone and it works like this. If you've, ever, if you've ever played the memory game when you were a kid or maybe now, and you see faces and you turn them over and you try and match the faces, it's similar to this. You'll see an array like this on your phone and if you're in the neutral condition, you'll be asked to pair neutral images, for instance, hangers, with flowers. So you'll see an array like this, and then everything will disappear except the hanger, and then you've got to click this box. That's where the flower was. And so you're told ahead of time what kind of pairings to make. So if you're in the neutral condition, you see all of these, but you'll, you'll make neutral, neutral pairings. If you're in the treatment condition, you'll see these, and you'll be asked to pair suicide-related images with things that are naturally aversive, like snakes or insects. And the idea here is can we, by repeatedly pairing these things and have you pair them, have you developed a, a, a negative association to the idea of suicide or self-injury by just doing this a few minutes a day for a month? And so what we did is three randomized trials where we randomly assigned people to the treatment condition or the control condition, and what we found was for people in the, in the treatment condition, significant reductions in self-cutting, in suicide planning, and in actual suicidal behavior. And we did this three times because it was done the first time and we were kind of surprised by the results. And so did it again and then did it again and across three trials saw pretty, pretty, pretty good results. And this is just, I think, one example of thinking about the labs of the future, a very different approach to, what, to how we do things now in terms of psychotherapy. If you want to do a randomized clinical trial, you'll generally need a few years and a few million dollars. These three trials were done by a postdoc and team in our lab over the course of about a year as a sort of side project on a larger study that we were doing. So these approaches are, are, are feasible, they're scalable, and they're really easily disseminable. And this app is actually now freely available on the App Store. It's called, it's called Tech Tech, or it's T-E-C, T-E-C. Anyone can download it and use it. And so my two cents in this, in this domain would be 
for us to really mind the gaps, to not just blindly follow technologies that might emerge, but to think about what is our question, what are the gaps in our understanding, and then what tools could help us answer those questions and fill those gaps. And I talked about a few examples here. And I didn't talk much about challenges for the future, but I'm sure we'll do this in the, in the Q&A portion just briefly. As we get better and better at identifying people at risk using behavioral tests, using real-time monitoring, how do we deliver information about high risk to the patient? And what about to the person's clinician? Uh, much easier said than done and a lot of challenges there. Which assessments, which interventions work best for which people? We'll need larger samples to, 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 to answer that question, but as we do, we can get closer to precision medicine. And some of the biggest challenges here are the ethical ones. How do we ethically monitor people and collect passive data and active data and implicit data from them? Uh, and how and when do we intervene once we have those data? So a lot of really important open questions, but hopefully as we move forward, we'll continue to take steps towards developing the lab of the future. Thank you very much.